Hello again everybody and today uh, I'm going to move from uh, thinking about travel and transport in the Roman world and we're going to start thinking about travel and transport in the Greek world. Uh, there's going to be several aspects uh, to this, uh, some of it's going to be about uh, navies and naval warfare uh, but today we're going to start with Homer. Everything in Greece, so much in European uh, culture, starts with Homer and indeed we're going to start with Homer uh, on this. So, the story of Odysseus is told in the Odyssey. Um, Odysseus has been uh, marooned on an island with a nymph called Calypso. He's been there for seven years and he has eventually, it's eventually be, been agreed that he will be allowed to go. So he's been detained by Calypso uh, but he really wants to go home. Um, he has regularly slept with her uh, and he has regularly sat on the shore and wept and said he wants to go home to Penelope but eventually uh, through the intervention of Athene he has been told he can go home. But the problem is he's on an island and he hasn't got a boat so what he's got to do is build one or build something that's going to get him off the island and get him home again. Now Homer uses this uh, to demonstrate some key things um, about Odysseus and perhaps he uses this almost like a metaphor for uh, the leadership qualities uh, of his hero. So he has demonstrated his skill as a teller of tales, he's demonstrated his fighting prowess uh, but here he's going to demonstrate his skills as a craftsman. So it's kind of the ideal man for Homeric society and uh, here we go, this is, uh, imagine the scene uh, of uh, Odysseus sitting uh, on Calypso's island and he's got some materials together and he's now going to build a boat or a raft. And this is what Homer says. The new dawn had scarcely touched the east with red before Odysseus put his cloak and tunic on. The nymph dressed herself too in a long silvery mantle of a light material, charming to the eye, with a splendid golden belt round her waist and a veil over her head. Then she turned her thoughts to the problem of her noble guest's departure. First, she gave him a great axe of bronze. Its double blade was sharpened well and the shapely handle of olive wood fixed firmly in its head was fitted to his grip. Next, she handed him an adze of polished metal and then led the way for him to the farthest part of the island where the trees grew tall, alders and poplars and firs that shot up to the sky, all withered timber that had long since lost its sap and would make buoyant material for his boat. When she'd shown him the place where the trees were tallest, the gracious goddess left for home, and Odysseus began to cut the timber down. He made short work of the task. Twenty trees in all he felled, and lopped their branches with his axe, then trimmed them in a workmanlike manner, and trued them to the line. Presently Calypso brought him augurs. With these he drilled through all his planks, cut them to fit across each other and fixed this flooring together by means of dowels driven through the interlocking joints, giving the same width to his boat as a skilled shipwright would choose in designing the hull for a broad-bottomed trading vessel. He next put up the decking, which he fitted to ribs at short intervals, finishing off with long gunnels down the side he made a mast to go in the boat, with a yard fitted to it and a steering oar too to keep her on her course. And from stem to stern he fenced her sides with plaited osier twigs and a plentiful backing of brushwood as some protection against the heavy seas. Meanwhile, the goddess Calypso had brought him cloth with which to make the sail. This he manufactured too, and then lashed the braces, halyards and sheets in their places on board. Finally, he dragged her down on rollers into the tranquil sea. By the end of the fourth day, all his work was done, and on the fifth, beautiful Calypso saw him off from the island. The goddess had bathed him first and fitted him out with fragrant clothing. She had also stowed two skins in his boat, one full of dark wine and the other and larger one of water, besides a leather sack of corn and quantities of appetising meats. And now a warm and gentle breeze sprang up at her command. It was with a happy heart that the good Odysseus spread his sail to catch the wind and used his seamanship to keep his boat straight with the steering oar. There he sat and never closed his eyes in sleep, 
but kept them on the Pleiades, or watched the Boaties slowly set, or the great band, nicknamed the Wayne, which always wheels round in the same place and looks across at Orion the Hunter with a wary eye. It was this constellation, the only one which never bathes in ocean stream, that the wise Calypso, goddess Calypso told him to keep on his left hand as he made his way across the sea. So for seventeen days he sailed on his course, and on the eighteenth there hove into sight the shadowy mountains of the Phaeacians country, which jutted out to meet him there. The land looked like a shield laid on the misty sea. Things go a bit wrong there because Poseidon sees him and uh, wrecks him. But uh, you can see how Homer has vividly described the construction of the ship and uh, and he, he's, he's made it almost godlike and given it a sort of godlike aura, uh, the whole business of the craftsmanship. This shows Homer's familiarity with boat building, so important in a seafaring society, and it's all the more remarkable if Homer was, as the legend goes, blind. But in order to achieve his purpose, Odysseus needs strength, he needs knowledge, and he needs skill to achieve his purpose, all qualities of leadership in the society of that day. Now this might cause us to think, nowadays, what qualities might we expect of our leaders, and what activity might they be engaged in which would display those skills.